Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Monday, April the 19th, 2021. It is currently 1121 a.m. Central Time, and I'm here at Victory Baptist Church, Ovalo, Texas. Yes, it's Monday. Now, typically, I take Mondays off. Typically, I just make the decision, you know what, Uh, I was here for multiple hours on Sunday, and I did as much as I could, so I'm just going to relax on Monday. But when Sunday doesn't go well, when I'm not happy with Sunday, then I come back on Monday to try to erase everything that I felt went wrong on Sunday. Now, a lot of pastors, um, it's Within the pastoral world, I can't speak for every pastor, but a lot of pastors talk about that, the Monday morning blues. The Monday morning, Monday is just filled with like a day of regret. You look back, you're like, the sermon didn't go well. This didn't go well. This many people showed up. These people didn't show up. And you just, you do a lot of just contemplating your future on Mondays. As a pastor, you sit there thinking, you know what? I don't know if this ministry thing is really worth it. I, I think I'm just going to resign. I think I'm going to quit. I think I'm going to find a new profession. There's got to be something better. There's got to be something more fulfilling than this because you just, uh, you know, you you always have you always have an idea in your mind of how Sunday is going to go, right? You always thought, okay, I think we're going to do this. We're going to do this. It's going to go like this. And then when Sunday's over, now, usually for me, Sunday nights are the worst. That, that's usually where I really just feel just like depressed. Mondays, a lot of times, I wake up and can just kind of brush it off and just move on and start looking forward you know, to what I need to do next. But, but one of the things I do have a tendency to do is I, I will come back here on Monday hoping that I can kind of produce something to make up for what I produced on Sunday. See, if I produce things on Sunday that I, I, don't, feel, I don't really feel are any good— I really, I mean, I, I honestly, I, I, I do a lot of thinking about this. If you, if you listened Sunday, I did a Bible study exercise on praising yourself, and that was very, that was very convicting to me. I, I, I spent a lot of time last night just thinking about that and, and really convicted. And, and I hope you understand when I do those Bible study exercises, yes, I'm trying to do them for you, but, but I'm doing, I mean, it's my own, it's my own time of Bible study as well. So, so, you know, I always walk away, you know, even if no one else benefits from it, I always benefit greatly from it. But I was really convicted about that and because I just think about, I wonder how, how much, how often I make ministry about me and not about what it should. And, and I, I've tried to do everything I can to protect myself from that. I, I, don't, I don't put my name on anything. I, I've, I've gone a beyond, above and beyond what I can to protect myself from that. But sometimes I, I'm still like, uh, for example, Sunday went, I, I felt Sunday went horribly. I, fe- I felt the Sunday school lesson wasn't very good. I felt the Sunday, mo- the Sunday morning sermon, which is a continuation of Sunday school, because we got started so late that I, I couldn't do justice to Romans chapter eight. So that was really frustrating. And so when I drove away, I was like, that was, that was embarrassing. That was horrible. But was I upset because I don't felt like I gave the people what they deserved and what they needed and what I wanted to give them? Or was I upset because I felt like it made me look like I didn't do a very good job? In other words, was I more upset about what I gave the people or was I more upset about how I, how I looked? I, I hope you understand that. And that's, that's that's when you really get down in your spiritual maturity. You, that's where you really, that's a very important line to get to in your spiritual maturity where you start looking at your motivations and the reasons why you feel a certain way and why you do what you do because uh, we, we can cover everything up with a, a, a kind of a layer of spirituality, but sometimes we really got to ask what's going on inside of ourselves. So, when I, when I got home and I was like, okay, I want to go back Monday. Do I want to go back Monday because I really feel bad for everyone listening online that that was a waste of their time? I mean, there's a lot of people who listen to us on Sundays. Did I waste their time? And, and so do I, did I want to come back here today 
Did, did, did I want to come back here today because I felt bad that I wasted everyone's time on Sunday? Or did I want to come back so that I could produce something to make me feel better about myself? That like and 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 you can convince yourself. You can convince yourself you're doing things for a certain reason when the reality you're doing it for yourself. You can you can do so much within the Christian life that you say you're doing it for other people, that you're ministering to other people, you're trying to help everyone else, but in, in some cases, you're really doing it simply to elevate yourself so that you can get the praise, so that you can receive the praise of other people. It's more about self-exaltation than it is about ministry and serving people. We, we're, we, we, can, we always have to look at ourselves of why we're doing what we're doing. And, and, and so I'm here today, hoping, I'm hoping I'm here for the right reason. I'm hoping I'm here to make up for what I feel was a really poor Sunday that was not very well done and, uh, and you deserve better. So I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not saying I can produce better, but you deserve better. So I'm here to see what I can do for this Monday morning here in West Texas. Now, I knew, I have to give you a warning. Right outside the front door of our church, there's all this road construction going down, I don't know, I don't even know how many feet away from, from the front door it is. But um, I don't know if they're going to end up moving down to right here in front and right in front of the church. And if they do, it could get loud. I'm hoping that doesn't happen because I would hate this to be interrupted. But just if you hear some crazy sounds in the background, that could possibly be what is going on. But, um, you know, I, I need a bit a big red light outside saying on air that says on air, letting them know, hey, I'm on the air. So don't make any noise. But I, I don't really think that would matter to them. I, I really don't. I don't think they really care that I'm in here live on the air. But I hope you care that I'm live on the air. And I hope you're ready to listen to a little bit of church history. We're going to go to an area of New York. We're going to go back to the 1800s. And we're going to look at something that happened then. And then hopefully it'll get us to think about possibly how that could apply to evangelical Christianity in 2021. That's what we're going to try to do. Hopefully this is beneficial. I've talked about this historical kind of situation multiple times in sermons and in podcast episodes. So some of you may already be familiar with it. For those who are not, listen carefully. This comes from the podcast, Five Minutes in Church History, which I tell everyone in the world they should subscribe to. Um, This episode, I think, showed up I think yesterday, but I I saw, I listened, I started listening to it this morning and then immediately stopped and said, oh, we'll listen to that together on, well, the Theology Central podcast. So that's what we're going to do. Typically for five minutes in church history, they have their kind of like little music intro, but this one, there's no intro. It just jumps right in. So uh, just, you got to be prepared to listen as soon as I hit play because they're going to just start giving information immediately. It's only five minutes, so they have to cover a lot of stuff uh, relatively quick. But just put your thinking caps on, and uh, this is a very important thing that happened in church history. You should be familiar with it, and uh, well, let's see what we can learn from it today. Sounds sounds great? I think so. If you're listening to us live, as always, please say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be, however you may be listening. We always appreciate knowing that you're out there, and uh, well, here we go. Five minutes in church history and an episode they called Burned Over District. Burned Over District. Are you familiar with that term? You should be. If you're not, then good. You're in the right place. And then we'll talk about this moving forward. Here we go. Well, 200 years ago in 1821, Napoleon died. That's just a bonus. I just thought I'd throw that in there. But let's go to another part of the world about 200 years ago to see what was happening. We will go to Western New York, and we will be looking at the 1800s through the 1830s, right around there, 1821, 200 years ago. I hope I said the 1800s. I I don't think I said the 1900s. If I said the 1900s, I I was way off. 1821 to be exact, right? I'm going to back that up and just let you hear all of that again um, because I want this all to flow together. So if I gave the wrong date, I apologize, but it's numbers. I'm horrible with numbers, but here we go. Well, 200 years ago in 1821, Napoleon died. 
That's just a bonus. I just thought I'd throw that in there. But let's go to another part of the world about 200 years ago to see what was happening. We will go to Western New York, and we will be looking at the 1800s through the 1830s, right around there, 1821, 200 years ago. This was once known, and historians have dubbed it, the Burned Over District. In fact, some think that Charles Finney is credited with coining this expression. Well, let's dig into this Burned Over District. Revivalists would come through this section of western New York and the surrounding area year after year after year. This was the time of the Erie Canal, and it brought all kinds of prosperity, it brought lots of people to this region, and of course, along with that prosperity and towns popping up, all sorts of vices came along with it. So in come the revivalist preachers setting up their tent, and with impassioned pleas, they would call for revival and repentance. But unintended consequences followed from these years and decades of revival preaching upon revival preaching. Much of this preaching in this period that we refer to as the Second Great Awakening contrasted with the preaching that was part of the First Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening was very Calvinistic. It stressed God's work in the salvation of men and women. But this Second Great Awakening trended Arminian and stressed cooperating with God and stressed the work that men and women do in bringing about their own salvation. Well, let's go back 200 years and see the results of this burnt over district cropping up all around this area were all sorts of sects and movements and what we would come to call heresies. Top of the list is Joseph Smith. It was right around 1820 that he was visited by the angel Moroni and began translating those golden plates that contained the Book of Mormon. In 1830, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was officially organized. This was right in the midst of the burnt over district. Smith gathered around himself quite a group of disillusioned and burned over people. And eventually they left there and they kept heading west and they went all the way to Utah. This was also the time of William Miller who came from this area. Well, after serving in the War of 1812, he threw himself into religion and Bible study. He was consumed with prophecy and began making calculations based on his interpretations of the numbers in the books of Daniel and Revelation. In 1822, he predicted that Christ would come back on March 21st, 1844. He gathered followers, again, these disillusioned and burned over over folks. And when March 21st, 1844 came and went, he recalculated the date, declared that he had made a mistake and set October 22nd, 1844 as the new date. And when it came and went, it was quickly dubbed the Great Disappointment. There was also Ellen White. She was moving a bit past the 1820s, but she came from this region. She claimed to have a few thousand visions and was the co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Also from this area were the Fox sisters who claimed to be mediums. Historians credit the beginning of spiritualism in America to the Fox sisters in this very area of the Burnt Over District. In 1888, one of the Fox sisters, Margareta, revealed that it was all a hoax and even revealed their techniques, but nevertheless, there it was. It was also a time and place for establishing socialist experiments in utopian communities. The prime example is the Oneida community, founded by John Humphrey Noyes in Oneida, New York in the 1840s. And again, gathering around himself the disillusioned and the burnt over from this burned over district. Well, there you have the legacy of the burned over district 200 years ago. And I'm Steve Nichols, and thanks for joining us for five minutes in church history. I see we have a little bit of bonus time this week, so I'm going to use that to share a quote with you. This from our friend back from 200 AD Tertullian. He told us the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Now, there is a lot of history 
and that little five minute episode. That's why you should subscribe to Five Minutes in Church History. It's it it should not be like, oh, I've learned church history because I subscribed to this podcast. It should give you places to start, places to investigate, things things to look up, people to look up. But that is crazy that so much happened in that area, in that part of New York, that that burned over district led to so many heresies, so many cults rising from that area. But I like the way he kept describing it, that this this area, because of this Second Great Awakening, because of this revivalist preaching that kept coming in, it created a burned over district filled with disillusioned people. And I will add the word discouraged. They were discouraged. They were disillusioned. And they kept looking for something. In other words, all of that revivalist preaching, for some reason, didn't accomplish what those preachers thought it was going to accomplish. Why not? Now, that's, that's a question for the historians to debate. I will argue that in a lot of revivalist preaching, you get this idea, and this is something I constantly complain about in modern evangelical in the modern evangelical movement and the modern evangelical world because we we borrow some of those same tactics from the second great awakening that revivalist kind of preaching where you come in it's basically like come to Jesus and boom everything's going to be wonderful your life's going to be changed and you won't struggle with this any, anymore and you won't struggle with this any, anymore and you're going to be you're going to be you're going to have all, all of these things are going to be a part of your life and, and and it promises almost like a utopia a utopian existence. It's almost the way it's preached. Like you're not going to struggle anymore. You're not going to have any problems anymore. Now they'll still throw in, oh, you're still going to struggle with sin, but they so hype up that you're going to have power. You can now say yes to God. The power of sin is defeated in your life. I've played example after example of sermons doing this. And then people say, like, like, amen, I want this. And then you're a Christian for four, five, six, seven years. And then guess what you find? You still struggle with sin. You still have problems. There's problems in the church. There's church splits. There's backbiting. There's gossip. There's scandal. There's failure. Marriages fall apart. Marriages implode. Uh, Christian teenagers are getting pregnant out of wedlock. There's problems with pornography. And you're like, wait a minute. Where's all this great power that we were promised? Where's all of this great? And you end up with an area where people become disillusioned and discouraged. And then they start looking somewhere else for some kind of truth. And then someone else comes along offering them something else. This disillusionment, and discouragement that came from that. And I think that revivalist kind of preaching preaches that. Look, stay, turn from that. And then there's all of these promises that you're going to get. Again, you hear this all the time in, in Christian church after Christian church. Come to Christ. Look, you'll become a new creature. The old is gone and all things have become new. And that is preached not in your positional standing, but in your practical standing. So the old is gone. Everything has become new. And 30 minutes of being a Christian, you realize the old isn't really gone. It's still present within you. You still struggle. Everyone still struggles. And at some point, you either have to convince yourself of a reality that you're not actually experiencing or you start getting very disillusioned and very discouraged, which creates a burned out number of people. Now, we, we have a region there in New York. We have a specific period of time. But I wonder how many people have been, in a sense, burned. They've been burned by their experiences with Christianity. They've been burned. Oh, you know, they've, they've been burned over burned out, burned, hurt, discouraged, and disillusioned by what they witnessed and what they experienced. Now, you wish that they would, there, there's, look, what happens within Christianity is very different than the truth of Christianity. Those are two very different things. But I think we, I think we may be reaching, and, and, and you could tell me if I'm wrong, so I, I think we have a lot. I think we have a lot of things going on, and and and, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. In the 1990s, right, we had the, the rise of purity culture. 
Here now, we are seeing a lot of people who came out of that period who are now very discouraged, disillusioned, claim that that hurt their 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 you know their sexuality, hurt their marriages, hurt, and 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 they've become discouraged, disillusioned, and they've abandoned in many cases Christianity because of what they experienced. They they're burned. They were in a sense in a burned out time of Christianity, and they were they experienced that, and they and it, it did not lead to anything good. And now people look back at that period of time going, man, the church was really trying to do the right thing. They were trying to teach biblical sexuality. They were trying to do the right thing, but maybe we went about it the wrong way. And now look at all the negative consequences. There's always, we, it's always hard to see the unintended consequences at the moment. Looking back, it's always easy to go, see, it's there. So so we have we have that. And I don't think there's any way to deny that. A lot of people have come now out of the purity culture who are very bitter, very discouraged, very disillusioned, and in many cases abandoning Christianity. Right now, we have a lot of people going through this, you know, um, they're moving away from, from, from uh, you know, Christianity. They're, they, are, they are, in a sense, deconstructing. We, we talked about that phrase, deconstructing. Why are they deconstructing? If you listen to them, if you listen to them, um, and we and we had the great example from those TikTok videos that one of our listeners sent to us. You hear a lot of the disillusionment, discouragement, like they've been in a situation where they are a part of a burned over area. Why were they discouraged? Why were they disillusioned? What what happened? I think I think so. You have the purity situation, and I think the second thing you just have a lot of Christians from a lot of different periods of time who were just given, fed all of these promises of Christianity and they did not witness them and experience them. They, 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 they realized that they were still a sinner. They still struggled. People around them were still sinners and they became discouraged and disillusioned, right? So that leads to a lot of the uh, deconstruction that we are watching and happening in many people's lives and they're posting it on social media. Here's one. I want you to think about this. Now, we may not be able to determine it today, but I think five years from now, 10 years from now, are we going to find a whole generation of people who points back to the uh, Christianity of the United States of America? I cannot speak of the Christianity around the world, but they're going to point to the Christianity of the United States of in America from, say, 2015 to, say, 2021, 2022, 2023, and they're going, and they're, in a sense, they have been burned by that Christianity at that time because of the, politis, the political hijacking of American Christianity, the political corrupting of American Christianity. And they're going to look back and go, forget that garbage. I, I, they, they're disillusioned, discouraged, and burned. They, they're in a burned over area because of the politics that came into Christianity. And what do they, what do they move to? What groups are going to emerge from all of this? But there's no question to witness that Christianity has gone through a major upheaval over the last four to five years. I, I, I just don't know how, I, there's got to be books that are going to be written about this. The, the politics within American Christianity has corrupted it tried to redefine it. I mean, I've been preaching on it and preaching on it. There's going to be a generation of people who are going to say, look, I'm, they were discouraged, disillusioned, and they're going to come out of a burned out, burned over area. How many, how many times throughout church history have we had a burned over area because of unintended consequences? Where, where those involved thought they were trying to do the right thing. They really thought they were trying to do the right thing. I think I, I'm, 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 there's, I'm, there's, there's so many different examples of this in my mind, but I think we, I think the po- the politics, the politics, I think create that. Here's another example. Just, just stay with me here. Just think about it. There's a lot of, I mean, and this goes with the politics, but there's a lot of Christians today who feel that it's, it's almost the mission of Christians. It's the mission of the church to bring about social change. In other words, that we need to change the culture. And that may be, and you could do this on the left or you can do it on the right, that we need to change the culture. We need to, we need to 
to whether save a certain political ideology or whatever the case may be, that we have a cultural mandate where I tend to see Christianity is not a cultural mandate, but as a, as a gospel mandate to preach the gospel to individuals. God saves individuals. As individuals become saved, society has changed. We go, we preach the gospel to the individual. We don't try to redeem the culture by policy, force, or whatever the case may be. But I think, I think a church has really had a social-minded mission, whether it's politics, whether it's left, whether it's right. And I think there's going to be grow, there's going to come from that a lot of people who are in a burned over district and what's going to come out of the ashes of that burned over district. In the 1800s, what came out of that burned over district were cults, was heresy. What's coming, what's going to come from what we see now? What, what's going to emerge? I, I think we're in an area right now within American Christianity where not only have we kind of, I think we're burning the area right now, all right? It's like going back to the 1800s, watching the, the great, the second great awakening happening, going to those tent revivals and you're sitting there looking at it going, uh-oh, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. This is gonna burn this area over. And I feel like right now we're in Christianity and I'm looking around going, we're burning this area over. We're burning it to the ground. And what's going to emerge from it? Now, that, that's, just, that's just some thoughts. But I would challenge you to go read about the Second Great Awakening. L- look up some of those people. Charles Finney, I think, is not only did, is he sometimes accredited with, with coining the term the burned over district. I think he's, part, he's, he's largely to blame for the burned over district. I think he's largely to blame for it. And, and I, don't, I don't think there's any way to deny that. But you can, uh, well, you can, you can throw in some of your thoughts by emailing me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, thanks for listening. I'll be back on the air shortly. Everyone have a great day. God bless.